Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. My guests are Anita Altman and Naftali Moster. Anita is a longtime friend and colleague who recently introduced me to Naftali and their organization, which is called Yafa, Young Advocates for Fair Education. I invited them to join me because I'd like you to hear their story. First of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, so um, I grew up Hasidic in... Uh, Where did you grow up? I went, I grew up right here in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, in the neighborhood called Borough Park. Um, very Hasidic, I have a large Hasidic family. Um, and I attended Hasidic yeshivas my entire life. And then at approximately the age 20, I began being drawn to the concept of psychology. I didn't have much exposure to this as a child, but I was interested in it. And uh, so I wanted to pursue higher education. And uh, I began inquiring how to do it. And I found a local program that actually caters to ultra-Orthodox, or at least Orthodox, Jewish people. It's separate for men and women and all of that. And I walked in there and I said, I want to become a psychologist. Mind you, I didn't know how this works, how enrollment works, or what the word enrollment would mean, or anything like that. And it became very apparent to the school, too, that I, I don't know what's going on. So they asked me if I had a high school diploma, and I said, what is that? And, and so they said, oh, go to your yeshiva. They'll give you a high school diploma. And I went there. They gave me a letter that I completed high school, but it was not a high school diploma. So the school tried to get me in through different means, um, through a, a, a placement exam that you end up taking 24 credits accounts towards your high school diploma and towards your degree, um, but you still need to pass a basic entrance exam. And that consists, I believe, of writing an essay and an easy math quiz, essentially. But I didn't know how to write an essay or even what the word essay means. Um, I couldn't do any basic math, even arithmetic, right? So this is when I first got the kind of realization that I had received a pretty terrible education. Why did you, how did you get the idea you wanted to be a psychologist? How did you even know what a psychologist was? That, that's a good question. <laughs> I actually didn't know what the word psychologist meant. I knew what the word psycholog means. Uh, that's the way you say it in Hebrew and in uh, Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And there was this one psychologist in my community. In hindsight, I don't know if he was a real psychologist or he was referred to. Sorry, or if he was just referred to as such, but, um, but you know, I, I admired it and I thought I had witnessed mental illness in my community, even in my family, that went undiagnosed and untreated, and I thought, I might be good at it and I would love to pursue it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got the idea, but sure enough, I didn't know anything. It turned out, I didn't know, like I said, what the word essay meant, but I also didn't know what a semester is, what a credit is, what GPA is, uh, none of those things, you know. Um, so finally, when I, when I ended up getting into school, um, and, and they made sure I got in because it was a small what school. What school is this? It's, it's a branch of Toro College. Uh -huh. It's called Machala Parnasa. And um, I had to take remedial courses in English and, and math and so forth. And in all other subjects, I struggled immensely. It, it was kind of like I came from a different planet, not knowing basic words, basic concepts. Um, so this is kind of how it all began when I realized Something was off with the education I'd received. But at the time, I thought, like many people in New York and elsewhere think, there's no requirement for non-public schools or yeshivas to provide any kind of secular education. It's a private school, right? So they could do whatever they want. That's the myth. Were I'd you fluent in English? No, not at all. I could barely communicate in English. So that's why I had to take remedial English, eight credits of remedial English, which did not go towards my degree. It was only eight credits in terms of the number of hours. So, um, so yeah, I, like I said, couldn't write an essay, didn't know what it would consist of. Um, so, so this is kind of like what got me, you know, looking into it. And I figured, like I said, like most people think these are private schools, they could do whatever they want. But eventually, as I was going through my schooling, and I had transferred to a CUNY, and I was taking intro to biology. I had left it off till the end, okay, in my senior year. And I took intro to biology, and in this classroom, um, I was surrounded by average, I think, public school graduates, and we're learning these basic concepts, which for most k kids in the classroom, it was just a, a repeat of what they had learned in high school, right? Um, but for me, every single word was new. A molecule, a cell, an organism, a biodiversity, photosynthesis, literally the first time me hearing it. Um, and it became very apparent that that this is not how it's supposed to be. And for the first time, it hit me that what had happened to me was a form of neglect. And I figured, you know, I must be the first one to coin this concept, educational neglect. But I began doing some research, and I discovered that this is a real concept which exists, and, and uh, you know, normally it happens in isolated cases, and you don't think of it as happening on such a massive scale right here in the heart of 
New York and New York City. Uh, I discovered that New York State had very clear laws that non-public schools, including yeshivas, must provide an education that is, quote, at least substantially equivalent to those of public schools, which means they could be the same or better, but can't be so, so much worse. Let me just interrupt you for a minute. Sure. Did you, what did your family say? Was uh, your family supportive? Did they pay the tuition? No. Um, I mean, first of all, I don't come from a family with a lot of means, mm -hmm. but in generally speaking, they were not supportive of me pursuing higher education. There were several concerns that, first of all, it could harm me, um, my own views, you know, but uh, number two, that it could harm the image of myself, of the other siblings who need to have um, sort of arranged marriages, um, and all of it is based on a reputation. So how did you, who supported you to go to college? Well, I, I managed to uh, receive what's called a dependency override, which means even though I, had still, I was still living by my parents, uh, for purposes of, of tuition, of uh, getting FAFSA, I believe, um, they, the school is able on a case-by-case -case basis to declare someone independent if it's very clear that the family is not supportive. That's the college. Yes, exactly. And so that was one, but I also, I was working full time. Um, I got a job working in a warehouse. That's the only thing I was qualified to do, literally schlepping boxes all day. Uh, and it was very um, disturbing. Um, and I don't know if the word is like a dissonance, right? Where in my mind, I was, I, I think I was a smart kid. <laughs> I was clearly, clearly drawn to higher education. I was doing well in school. You know, I was dedicating hours, weekends, evenings. And I was doing well, but here I was during the day just doing the most mindless work, uh, you know, schlepping boxes. Um, so that was, that was very disturbing. But, um, but yeah, so eventually I discovered that the law requires this, um, and I began, you know, just informally asking around, you know, what can we do? How do we address it? I even approached some yeshiva leaders, some rabbis, and it became clear that this is a massive issue that is not just going to change itself. So eventually I formed Yafed. Now, how did you meet... Uh, Anita. I actually worked at UJ Federation for almost three decades and um, about 20 years ago as a result of a re remarkable bequest we were able to establish a scholarship program for economically needy Jews attending um, school in the New York metro area and Naftali was one of the applicants and in his application he wrote about his journey and the fact that he had organized um, this put together this organization that was really struggling to address it and recognizing that his story was not very different from other of the relatively scant but applications coming from males in the Hasidic community who had begun to recognize that they had large families and had an obligation to take to provide for them and that the community needed professionals who are culturally sensitive um, I reached out to Niftali and said I'd like to learn more. And um, as you will see as the story goes, um, the work that has been undertaken by Yafed, I think, is really sacred work. And this is, for me, an issue of social justice. Um, and, uh, and I'm proud to be the chair of the board of this organization and helping um, not only Niftali, but a whole community of people who really recognize that they've been cheated and, and want to stop that for literally thousands of other um, Hasidic youngsters in our city. What were you doing in the yeshiva that you didn't have these other classes? Great point. I was just going to say we should go back to the basics. Yes. So we talk about this almost like in code that, you know, we didn't get a mm -hmm. good education. It was educational neglect. We need to tell the audience what, is it, what does it really look mm -hmm. like. So here's what it looked like. In elementary school, uh, we received approximately 90 minutes of secular education and it happened at the end of the day. And what was it? So, I'll get to that. <laughs> okay. We started yeshiva, for most of the grades, we, we started yeshiva at 9 a.m., and we studied Judaic studies till about 3.30 p.m., and then we had, for like I said, about 90 minutes, depending on the grade, of secular education, which, cons which consisted of just basic English and arithmetic. Um, but it, there are a few more things to add to it. First of all, the very young grades, like first and second grade, get zero secular education. In most yeshivas, from once the boys reach eighth grade, they get zero secular education, and then beyond that, they get zero secular education. And what do they do? In, in high school, so they study exclusively Judaic studies. Uh, in fact, in high school, the school day extends, and it's now about 12 to 14 hours. Boys show up to yeshiva approximately 6.30 or 7 a.m. They go till about 8.30 or 9 p.m. and study exclusively Judaic studies, such as the Torah, Talmud, Halacha, which is Jewish law, and Hasidic um, philosophy or thought. 
Um, most of it, if not all, taught in Yiddish, or a little bit of a mix of Hebrew, Aramaic, but the spoken language is Yiddish. So, um, so the point is that even, you know, in, in regular schools, a lot of teaching, a lot of learning happens in the classroom. But in the, it, you know, outside of it, you know, you also learn from communicating with the peers, using the English language, learning different ideas. Obviously, in the secular world, they watch TV, watch movies, listen to the radio, read secular books, um, interact, you know, go to different programs that are, you know, not exclusively Judaic. Here you have such an insular community where in addition to only receiving 90 minutes of basic English and arithmetic and nothing else, and, and of course no secular education at all in high school, there's also no other opportunity for kids to really learn the language. They communicate in Yiddish with, amongst themselves, with their peers, with their parents, with their siblings. And nowadays most uh, local supermarkets, you know, you only speak Yiddish to the cashier. Um, many car services are just Yiddish laundromats. It's all, so there's really it's no opportunity. It's a community. If, exactly, and it's, a, it's a very all Very close immersive. community. Exactly, it's very insular and, and very immersed. And an average uh, teenager, we're talking about like high school kid, uh, gets zero exposure to, let's say, people like yourself um, or to Anita. <laughs> and, or, and nowadays, or to myself, but the point is um, they only see and interact with people who look like themselves or like their parents, speak the same language, have the same exact thoughts. The newspapers, um, the boys, you know, only read Yiddish newspapers, but even the few English newspapers that are geared more towards the women, um, it's all, all very insular and uh, narrow kind of views and perspectives could be shared. What, what happens to your sisters? Where do they go? So... Great question. Uh, the girls tend to get a better education because um, if you understand why the boys don't get a, a good education, mm -hmm. you understand why the girls do get. So the reason the boys get deprived of this education is, uh, of course, a lot of people like to say that the one and only reason is because rabbis want control over the community, and if they deprive them and essentially handicap them for life, they're stuck in the community. I'm not saying that's not true, but I don't think that's the main reason. I think the main reason is simply because they take a an extreme interpretation of where the Torah says you shall study this day and night, um, and which we're referring to the Torah, and they think that boys should basically learn it all the time. In fact, do they want to be rabbis when they're exactly? And and from their perspective, every boy is destined and therefore groomed to become a rabbi. Girls, on the other hand, they can't become rabbis in ultra orthodox mm -hmm. um, Judaism. They can't become rabbis. They're even not allowed to study the Talmud which is what the boys mm -hmm. spent almost their entire day studying. So therefore, the girls um, have all this extra time. And since the husband is destined to be a rabbi, someone has to be able to provide uh, you know, a modest living for the family. So the girls get a better education. As soon as they graduate, oftentimes they become teachers, bookkeepers, and mm -hmm. you know, other kinds okay, of Okay, let's go forward now. Once you decided that there were, once you discovered there were regulations yeah. and that schools applied to private schools as well, what did you do? Um, I began reaching out to, to education officials. and the board at the New York Department we, of Education? We started in the New York City and then went up to the New York State Education Department. This was under a previous commissioner um, and, of course, under a previous chancellor in New York City. And each one basically said, oh, the other one's responsible. Um, in fact, in the beginning, they didn't even know about this requirement. Mm. For some local superintendents within Brooklyn, for instance, we had to pull up the guidelines on their computer and show them about the requirement and about their role in, in mm -hmm. enforcing now, it. Now, they had a requirement because they were, they were educational institutions, but they were also receiving federal and state funds. So you're talking about the yeshivas. Yes, the yeshivas have a requirement. The requirement exists regardless of whether you receive funds or not. Mm -hmm. oh. And that's common sense because mm -hmm. right. whether you receive funds from the we government want, or not, you need to feed, clothe, right. and, and yeah. provide shelter to your kids. Similarly, they have to provide it regardless. But you are right that many yeshivas receive a lot of money. In fact, in some cases, uh, a portion of the Hasidic yeshivas, I would say, and we did a report on this, that up to two-thirds of their overall budget is covered by government funding, and that includes federal, state, and some uh, local funding. So, yes, they receive a lot of funding, and, and that just adds even more of a string where mm -hmm. you, know, you would think that the government can say, hey, we're essentially funding this educational neglect. We should neglect. have some oversight. You know, we should have some oversight. Okay. But, but anyway, we went to the city, sent us to the state, back and forth. Eventually, in July of 2015, so it's about to be four years um, since then. In July 
on July 27th, 2015, we filed a very formal complaint with the New York City Board of Education, I mean Department of Education, um, which is under mayoral control, as you know. If I might, just for a second, I think that it, it needs to be clear that this is state law, but it's the local school districts that yes, have yes, our the enforcement are the have the enforcement. They and are the to oversight. provide the oversight and do the due diligence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And right. so in New York, it's the New York City Department yeah. of Education. Right. Exactly. The so elsewhere in the state, the, it would be the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. So for instance, East Ramapo or mm -hmm. Suffern right. or well, let's not get into that. You're one. Right. Right. All right. But the but so the point is, um, so we filed this uh, complaint. It was signed by 52 yeshiva graduates and parents, and it named 39 yeshivas that, w amongst the 52 of us, mm -hmm. were not meeting basic mm -hmm. uh, educational compliance. You know, substantial equivalency. That satisfied every kind of requirement of mm -hmm. filing a formal complaint. And you would think that when so many people come forward that the city would be like, whoa, this is yeah. huge, this is a big deal. They did announce an investigation the following day, on July 28, 2015. But from then on, it essentially went silent. For months, we were begging to get some information. Where is this investigation going? Nothing. They ended up telling the media that, yeah, they're investigating by sending a questionnaire to the yeshiva. So they're basically asking yeshivas to self-report whether they are meeting compliance. Mm -hmm. So eventually through pressure, they said they're also going to conduct visits, but those visits will be pre-announced, right? Announced prior to the mm -hmm. visits. And we yeshiva graduates know what this means, that the yeshivas could put up a show. But uh, repeatedly, the city kept promising they're going to produce a report on their findings and that they're completing the investigation. Years went by and they didn't do anything. Finally, last year, um, in, uh, in August of 2018, they finally released their first update. But here's something else that happened in the interim. New York State, as Anita mentioned, New York State sets the law, the regulations, and the guidelines, and then delegates the enforcement to the local districts. New York State said, fine, if there's a problem with these guidelines, they're not clear enough, let's have them clarified, okay, so that the local districts and the non-public schools know what's expected of each, and they could move forward with the enforcement. The state begins revising the guidelines, and in the process, they include a good Israel and other yeshiva interests, private school interests, Catholic school interests. And sure enough, um, Agudath Israel had a very powerful person in the state senate at the time, Senator Simcha Felder. So they sneakily got him to, in the last minute, a week before the budget, the 2018 uh, budget was passed, I guess that's a 2019 mm -hmm. year budget, um, they got him to insert this Felder amendment that was trying to exempt yeshivas from having to meet this substantial equivalency. If you think about it, the state mm -hmm. is working to revise the guidelines mm -hmm. mainly because this subset of private right. schools is not meeting the requirements, right. and here they are trying to pull the rug from under the, the guidelines, mm -hmm. and it won't apply to the very schools that need it the most. Luckily, they weren't fully successful, but the law did go into effect. It's unconstitutional because it does favor a very specific group, but it didn't cause the, the amount of harm that we initially feared. So months later, in uh, November 2018, the state finally released updated guidelines, okay? And it took into account the Felder Amendment, but it didn't kind of, it didn't give them too much special, you know, mm -hmm. special treatment. Ultimately, it required them to provide a mm -hmm. substantially equivalent education, as the law requires. And by the way, as New York Constitution requires mm -hmm. every child to receive a sound basic education. They, they were furious, and they launched massive attacks on it in, in every kind of format. Finally, when they saw everything else didn't work, they filed lawsuits but three lawsuits. Yeshivas filed a lawsuit, the Catholic schools filed a lawsuit, and here's the big surprise that we did not expect. The private elite schools got together and filed a lawsuit too. So the private elite schools, there's a, an umbrella group called NYSES, um, New York State Association for Independent uh, Schools. They filed a lawsuit uh, along with like nine or 10 um, plaintiffs, uh, individual schools, right. including schools like Brearley, uh, the Spence School, Packer, uh, Collegiate, Collegiate uh, uh, exactly, and it was, it was a devastating thing to see that these private mm -hmm. elite schools were comfortable aligning themselves mm -hmm. with what is blatantly educational neglect. Purely well, well, and then the Catholic school system right, is, right. is observant of, I mean, does the guideline, follows the guidelines, right. They all follow, here's the, the So they the all came thing. together. They, they follow they the guidelines. But they, they all came together to essentially defend the yeshivas. You could argue that they also want to defend themselves from any additional regulations, which is in the DNA of every business to try to like mm -hmm. have as little regulations as possible. That's certainly the case. But guess what? We need to have some regulations mm -hmm. to protect children that are clearly being denied yeah. an education. So now where are we? 
the private elite schools argument that unfortunately prevailed, which is arguing that the guidelines are really regulations disguised as guidelines. What that means is guidelines the commissioner can just release and say, this is based on the regulations, so it goes into effect right away because the regulations are already in place. Um, but if you introduce new regulations, you need to go through a longer process. It requires at least 60 days of public comment and a vote by the Board of Education. We're, so what happened was they, they, the, the private schools won that case. The guidelines were struck down. So the state went and said, fine, we're going to propose th these regulations. But instead of doing emergency regulations, which could have gone into effect right away, and we would have had relief right now over the summer when schools are preparing for the next mm -hmm. school year, instead these regulations will only uh, go into effect after a few months of public comment and if when, and when the Board of Regents votes uh, to support it, to pass it. So, so we're now at an impasse. That exactly. That young men who are going to go to school starting in September will not have the basic education you think they should be. Exactly. Now, Thousands why do you think it's all this opposition? All this opposition from the yeshivas is self-understood. The way they see it is, you know, they have to protect uh, uh, an imaginary, um, you know, system that, that they've, you know, believed is the way to do it, you know, for many, many decades, and they don't want anyone changing it, right? Um, it's, it's upsetting because that's not what is supposed to be. We have Jewish schools around the state and around the country that managed to provide a we, great, great secular education. Yeah, we have excellent schools. Yeah. Right? Plenty of modern Orthodox oh, so, schools. So they supported this. And you, did you speak to them, the individual schools? I mean, we, they don't understand what you're saying? The modern Orthodox schools, we didn't have much communication. Mm -hmm. We're a small team, but uh, mm -hmm. we're slowly building up a little bit, and we're, we're definitely uh, seeking out to have mm -hmm. more um, communication and get them on board. But um, they certainly didn't come out uh, swinging in support of the guidelines, mm -hmm. which, is, which in itself is a problem because you would think that the Jewish community in particular, when you see what's happening to our Jewish brothers mm -hmm. and sisters, especially the fastest growing Jewish population and the amount of poverty it's causing exactly. and dependence on government assistance, you would think that the broader Jewish community would, would speak up. And, what, and frankly... What, what is the percentage of the ultra-Orthodox community that's on public assistance? In some neighborhoods, it's about 65%. You know um, Kiryas Joel, which is a, a little village in uh, Orange County, mm -hmm. upstate mm -hmm. New York, was named the poorest village in the entire country mm -hmm. in, based on the, the census. The Jewish community itself is a very complicated community. We have all sure. different ways of following our religion, right? right? But have you not been able to interest the non-ultra-Orthodox in supporting your efforts? Well. Most of them are supportive in theory, mm -hmm. right? In and behind closed doors. Mostly behind closed doors, yes. but, but they're certainly supportive of the concept. Mm -hmm. that they often question how they themselves can get involved. Mm. I think there's no excuse. The, the Jewish community um, is involved in a lot of social mm -hmm. justice issues, ranging from you know, protecting immigrants at the border, Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter, all kinds of amazing issues that the Jewish community often takes right. leadership on. Now, How can you ignore something in your own backyard? Let me talk about the mayor who is intent on trying to equalize the racism, eliminate the racism in the, the public school system. Right. What do they say about this? Well, the mayor has been the most disappointing figure because he literally has dragged out this investigation right. for almost four years now. And I think p potentially even coordinated or known about the Felder Amendment mm -hmm. and how this would delay it even right. further. So, but but I'm, we're very disappointed with so the way So it's a political thing also. It oh, always comes down to politics, it doesn't is it? It is extremely political. The, the ultra-Orthodox community votes almost in a block. Yes. And that's what public officials are it's interested in. You know, the recent, Who's gonna vote for them, right? So the recent election for the public advocate, um, it was the front runner was Jomani Williams mm -hmm. versus Eric Ulrich, right? Mm -hmm. And the almost the entire ultra-Orthodox community, backed by all their newspapers and everything, ended up backing Eric well, Ulrich for this one issue. Because, one issue. because Germani, Germani spoke out against the changing of the testing. He didn't take, a, he didn't take an issue on, right. the, on the yeshiva. Right. He, didn't, he didn't publicly uh, say pro or against it, but they sense that in Eric Ulrich, they'll have a strong ally who will basically go out of his way to defend the yeshivas, prop up the yeshivas, even the ones that we're saying are essentially committing educational neglect. So it just shows you this, this could be a single issue where they all unite against it. And the mayor, of course, knows this. Remember how he even got elected by promising certain goods <laughs> and then following through on them. And the governor? 
The governor, at least until recently, was also unfortunately um, viewed as being on the wrong side of the issue. Um, there were reports, which haven't been verified, um, that prior to his most recent re-election, he met with the Satmar rabbi in Williamsburg and promised that he's going to lay off, they're going to lay off this, the yeshivas. But um, in a recent interview with Brian Lara, he said that the state education department must be able to enforce the law. So hopefully he's kind of changing. We'll the hold him. Now. I'm we'll sorry to tell you that we've come to the end of this program. Right. But I think you've gotten what you wanted to say uh, spoken. And the story is very compelling. Thank you. And we need it. It's common sense, if nothing else, right? Exactly. You bet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, thank you so very much. much. And incidentally, Yaffa has a very good website, right? What's the website? www.yaffed.org. And, and the viewers will be able to watch, look at that website and really follow the progress of this group and hopefully join them. Thank you very much for coming. And I hope we meet again, as thank they say. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Thank you.